Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, evening, uh, etc. Normal stuff. Um, hi, everyone. So, what do we got? Uh, Robert on from uh, Illinois, Singapore, Zeng, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel, not sure which one, um, from Vienna. Claudio is in London. Um, what else we got? Alan is still on from Australia. Um, good evening, Alan. Um, 10 out of 10 for, uh, for effort. Um, what else we got? Mexico, Poland, blah, 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 Nova Scotia, etc. Um, Serge, Sergey or Serge, I'm not sure which one, but um, you made it live. Well done. First time. Cool. Um, JD's on, Tibby's on. Cool. Ralph is on. Loads of people are on. Good. Okay. Uh, so today, actually, we're going to start off talking about coronavirus just for fun, uh, because I should be on a trip to Iceland tomorrow. Um, but that's now all been cancelled and all been shut off. Um, because there's now a mandatory quarantine, fun times, um, for all travellers from all countries of the world um, as of yesterday, which is great. So thank you to those that started the virus and thank you to those that continue to spread it. You're ruining life as well as many others. Um, but anyway, let's get on with some editing, despite all the anger that's built up inside of me today. Um, anyway, let's move on to Capture One, uh, which is a lot happier subject to talk about. So Capture One, we are currently, as of right now, using version 20.1.2 um that's different so you've got you've probably all gotten used to me saying 20.1.1 or 13.1.1 even i've got used to saying that um in fact as of this morning or as of today capture one is updated it's now 13.1.2 if you look in your about screen you'll also see that that says build i think 37 um it's pretty small text there um, but build 37 uh, or 20.1.2 if you look at the marketing material, but effectively it's a 0.2 release. What's come with that release is a little bit of extra camera addition. So um, Canon's uh, R5 and R6 are on there. I think uh, there's a Sigma camera that's been added. Uh, there's another one, I can't remember which one, um, but there's also a few little bug fixes. So it's worth going online, downloading the update as of today. Um, there's a lot of things with Zoom and a lot of things with Color Editor that have been improved and enhanced. Um, there were a couple of little niggles um, that people were, were struggling with a little bit. So just please make sure you keep your software up to date. If you don't have Capture One version 20, then look at the upgrade page because there's quite a lot of offers on at the moment. Um, and if you, sorry, that's if you have Capture One but not version 20. Um, if you don't have Capture One at all, then download the free trial for the next 30 days. You can use it without limits. Everything we do today is going to be in the latest version, so 13.1.2. Um, but also remember there's a 25% discount on at the moment for Capture One. Um, so have a look at captureone.com and uh and download it if you want to have a play okay all that said ah that was it jd's just said it's the sony a7s3 has been added yes you're right uh that was the one i couldn't remember so it's the sony a7s3 there's a sigma fp i think and then the canon r5 and r6 they've all been added so if you've got one of those cameras you need 13.1.2 to be able to read in your raw files okay so let's go into capture one itself uh, and there we go. So as you can imagine with a point release, there's not really much change in terms of the interface or any functions or anything like that. It's more of a service change and, and a bug fix. Um, Lloyd has just asked, did they fix the open edit with plugin list they broke in 20.1? They did, Lloyd. Uh, so 13.1.2 oh, now fixes the window. It was a Windows only problem um, where if you went to uh, right click and I think it was open with or edit with, uh, then it wouldn't show up the programs that you have registered. That is now fixed. You'll be pleased to know. So uh, let's have a look at this shot. This is the shot that we finished on last week um, from Mac. Um, I said we'd start on it this time, so that's absolutely where we're going to begin. Um, so this is with, I mean, it's a, it's, an, it's a really cool shot. It's a very, very sharp shot on the bear itself. Um, so let's just have a little look first, though, at the cameras. There's a D500 at 600 millimeters on that Sigma lens. The Sigma lens, I don't think, is loaded into Capture One, so it's stuck with, yep, yeah, a generic profile. If we go into the Sigma setup here, I don't think... Uh, do, do, do. For a Nikon setup, what are we running? Nikon D500. Interesting. It hasn't picked that up. F5 to 6.3. Let's just have a little look. Uh, because we do actually have that lens loaded in, interestingly. Unless I've missed something, which your eyes of uh, many hundreds of eyes are probably going to be better than my um, single pair of eyes, but to me, that is the same lens. Yes, it is. 
Um, it doesn't have HSM in the, oh, it does, okay. So in this case, it didn't pick up that lens, but we can choose it manually. Just double sure, make double sure that when you do that, it is the exact lens. Um, so be really, really careful um, that you don't choose the wrong lens, otherwise you can have some uh, unwanted side effects. So with this lens shot at f8, there shouldn't be much in the way of diffraction. We're just going to do an analyze on chromatic aberration, um, as we always do. So that means that rather than using the generic profile that Capture One has loaded in from the lab, this actually takes that exact lens on this exact sensor and that exact camera body and reanalyzes it and fixes any aberration um, to best it as best it can. Okay. Um, I'm not too worried about any sharpness fall off or light fall off because I'm actually going to play with the crop with this one quite significantly. Uh, it's one of the things that we're going to um, play with quite a bit today is crop. Um, now, for a couple of the sessions beforehand, we've talked about um, what a histogram should look like for high contrast and low contrast and, and all that sort of stuff. And I think last time I talked about the contrast tool being a particularly blunt instrument, let's put it a polite way, um, because it literally takes the midpoint of the, um, of the histogram and it spreads um, the data. So it gets brighter for the brighter parts and darker for the darker parts, and that creates contrast. Makes sense. The problem is that if your histogram is shifted to one side or the other, effectively the second it's brighter than the middle, it's going to push everything brighter still. So you don't actually get more contrast. You just push things brighter or darker if it's the reverse. In this case here, this is our sort of perfect pyramid, as it were, um, where all the data is sat in the midtones. Now that means that two tools are really effective on this. I don't think we have to use them to a particularly high extent on this one, actually, because the uh, the picture itself is, is pretty good to start with. But effectively, if I now use contrast and watch this histogram at the top left, so as I use contrast, you can see it's effectively pushing down that middle and it's pulling the data left and right of this midpoint, which is exactly what the contrast tool does. In this case, look how horrible it's made the picture look. And the reason is because actually we already had a decent amount of contrast in these highlights here and these low tones here. We didn't need that extra contrast boost. But if you find a histogram that's particularly squashed in the middle and you don't have highlights and you don't have shadows, but you do have a lot of data in the middle and it is sat in the middle, that's what the contrast tool can do. It effectively spreads that data from the midpoint, brighter than the midpoint gets brighter, darker than the midpoint gets darker, and you, incre or you increase contrast. Likewise, clarity also comes into its own when you've got a lot of stuff in the midtones because clarity is a very effective tool on midtones themselves. So as I pull up clarity, you're going to see, so watch again that histogram. So you see it's a similar effect to the contrast tool. It's effectively stretching out things from the middle, pushing down those midtones. The reason it's pushing down the midtones is remember how clarity works. It says to one area or a boundary against another, are you darker or lighter than me? Okay, if you're lighter, make yourself even more lighter. If you're darker, then make yourself even darker still. With those two um, processes going on, so lighten the lighter areas and darken the darker areas in relative terms, you end up with less midtones because it's really difficult for an area to stay middle gray because it's either lighter or darker than its neighbor. So everything gets pulled effectively. Now clarity, as you can see, even right up to 90, hasn't had a really detrimental effect, but what it has done is sharp, it gives that impression of sharpening everything up, just making things pop a little more. So again, I'm gonna reset that. And then finally on this one, let's just go to structure. So where clarity does things for areas, and you can see that, structure does stuff for edges. And hopefully you can see that. So I'm gonna go over the top, let's do 100% uh, or 94 or whatever on structure. So structure is picking up all of those finer details in the things like fur and hair and any texture on anything, including noise. So be really careful with that because it includes noise. So what you're seeing with structure here is we also increase our visible. Let me just temporarily turn this off. So you hold down the Alt key or Option key and while you've got it held down, you can um, press the mouse button on this reset button and we can just reset one tool. That's different to before and after because that would reset the whole thing as I'm swiping left and right. So if I just want to reset one tool temporarily, hold down the Option key or the Alt key on Windows and then press the mouse on the reset button on the tool. And then when you're ready, let go and it will go back to how you dialed it in. So that's with our structure affected. That's without. So yes, it has absolutely increased the detail in the fur, 
but it's also increased our noise because noise is effectively a texture in the image and that's what structure is looking for. Clarity, on the other hand, won't increase noise, but it also doesn't attack the fur quite so well because it's looking for areas. It's looking for the difference in boundaries between two different areas. So in this case, I'm going to use a little bit of clarity just to give it a bit of a punch, a bit of a pop and a little bit of structure, probably a little bit more structure just to get that fur up. Now, what we could do if we think about it, if I want to increase the structure on the fur, so I want to get more detail on the bear, but I don't want to increase that on the noise or the noise in the background. Well, actually, what I could do is create a new layer. We'll call it bear fur. And with the brush tool, so this one, we'll press B on the keyboard. Uh, right click anywhere on the canvas and we can change our brush set or settings. So in this case, um, let's do actually we're going to leave it at 100. Really soft brush, a little bit big there. So that's good. And I'm just going to zoom into the bear. And let's go here. Let me just turn on my mask so you can see what I'm doing. So just on the bear. There we go. I could just draw an outline and fill the area, but for the sake of only a couple more brush strokes, it's easy just to just to paint it in. OK, so there's our bear selected. Press M to make the mask go away or to reappear. And with that fur, what we can do now is pull up the structure so we can do 100 percent if we want too much. Be careful, but we can easily get to sort of 25, 30 or so. The advantage of doing this, especially when it's animal fur and, and even details on, on someone's skin or hair, the advantage of doing this selectively is I haven't got any unwanted effect of the structure tool in the background. And we don't want that. We don't we don't want to bring out any noise in the background. We want the background to remain blurred, out of focus, um, with no texture in it. But we do want to bring up the texture in the in the subject. So we have a selective layer here for the bear with an increase in structure and then a background layer that increases the clarity across the whole image. So we've got a whole thing um, of, of extra contrast. Uh, question from JD. So there's no Sigma to Sony E mount 14 millimeter profiles. Is there a way to create your own profile? No. Um, so you can uh, you can save defaults for the camera, but as it is at the moment in Capture One, there is no way that you can create your own profiles for lenses um, or extenders or um, modifiers and adapters and so on. So um, you can set a, a load of defaults for that particular lens to come in with, but if the profile isn't there, then no, you can't add your own. Um, if you're missing a lens and there are lots of other people missing the same lens, put in a support request onto Capture One. Um, I can't get over the number of times people will say, why doesn't it do this or why don't we have that? Um, and you say to them, OK, so have you have you asked for it? Well, no. OK, so if you don't ask, you don't get general rule in life. Um, so genuinely, if you're missing a lens profile, if you have a bug that keeps annoying you, if you have a feature actually that you want, Go on to support.capture1.com, register it because you don't know if there are, it might not just be you. Your request might be the tipping point that says, actually, well, there's enough people now that want this. Um, so they'll get on and do it and put it as a priority. So please, please, if you're missing a lens profile, missing extenders and all that sort of stuff, please go onto the support site and add the, uh, add the request in. Okay, I said I'd um, touch on contrast. Um, so, in terms, oh, sorry, contrast in terms of crop. Um, so I'm just going to go back to our original um, crop on here, which was three by two. Um, and I'm going to pull this right in. This bear on the left is, is interesting, I'm sure. But this is the focus. And this actually is quite distracting in this shot. So what I'm thinking of is let's just pull down into here. And we're going to lose some of this extra foreground here, which isn't actually adding too much. We don't need too much of this um, background up here. But this is a really nice frame with that bear in there. And no, oh, my grid's set up wrong, so um, for thirds anyway. So to change your grid, remember, go to your Lens tab up here, and you can choose how many sections you want in your grid by typing them in there. So as I now move my crop tool around, I'm going to get a 3 by 3 grid. Um, if I want that bear to sit on exactly one third line, I can. That's up to you. Um, but to me, that feels like such a, you know, such a more powerful shot, um, just losing the other bear in the background. OK, um, so uh, Pablo's just asked, should the image be cropped to keep only one bear in the cross of a third rule? 
Yes, which is what we've just done. So um, sorry. So I forgot to mention earlier on, there's about a 15, 20 second delay. Obviously, we're streaming. So sometimes your comments come through a little bit later um, than I've actually already done it. But yes, fellow, exactly. I would absolutely crop this down and get rid of that second bear. Um, OK, uh, Stuart's just asked, am I using a tablet right now? No, I'm not. Um, I do have one. Here is even my little tablet pen. Um, but right now I'm using the mouse. Part of that is because for some of the streaming stuff, I have to be able to switch between different applications to do things like um, pulling up comments and stuff like that. Um, but normally I will use it. We talked about this actually on the Facebook group a, a couple of days ago. So I use a tablet for detailed mask stuff and detailed um, drawing into feathering of, of areas and so on. For that, I find it really, really useful. It's a lot more natural. It's better to use. Um, however, what I'm finding more and more is I'm making less and less local mask adjustments and detail adjustments and more and more global ones. And as Capture One increases the number of keyboard shortcuts and the way that we can use things quite efficiently, I'm finding I use a tablet less, um, to be honest, not more. Um, so I've had tablets for be 10 years or so um, and my use varies over the over that time depending on what I'm shooting if I was shooting people a lot more then I'd probably be using it more but for landscape stuff the constant switching between sort of keyboard mouse through the keyboard or tablet um, keyboard um, it, it doesn't really work for me all the time so I'm using it less and less unfortunately uh, not a good advert for whack on there but there we go um, so with our shot we now have it cropped um, a little bit uh, tighter. Um, it just feels like a better um, image that way. What I can do is vignette if I want to around the bear. But if I do that, I'm actually getting, so we've got an itchy nose, um, I'm actually getting a perfectly uh, elliptical vignette around the center of the image. That's not what I want. It doesn't help me. Um, so what I could do, and this is what a lot of people will now do, is they'll create a new layer. We'll call it vignette. And with that vignette, I'm going to go to my radial mask, this one, and I'm going to draw from the bear out here. And I'm going to pull this in so it's a nice soft mask. So you can see it. So the, the further apart this line is from this line, the more soft the fall off is on the gradient. The closer they are together, the harder that line is going to be. So let's make it really, really soft. Cool. And now with the outside, so remember the red area is the area you're affecting, the clear area is the area that won't be touched. If I wanted to change this, I'd right click and go to invert mask. Now I'm affecting the bear. Right click again, invert mask. Now I'm affecting the outside. So bear in mind, you can always flip the mask around with invert. So with that done, I can now, if I want to, I could even use just exposure and pull down our exposure. Now, with that done, unfortunately, we end up with a weird halo around the bear. So while it's perfectly fine, there's nothing really wrong with doing it this way. It does look a little bit fake. Um, a little bit is probably an understatement. So instead, what I'd encourage you to do is to start playing and just have a little play with a gradient mask that's flat, a normal gradient mask. Now, remember, I'm already on my layer. I'm already on my gradient layer. So if I draw another gradient mask, it's not going to add to that gradient, it's going to replace it. So in this case, it's now the second I've started drawing, it's now going to remove the gradient that I already have, which was round, and um, pull that in. <laughs> I didn't actually mean to do that, but yeah, you got me. Bear in mind. Um, so yes, bear in mind um, when dealing with bears. Good shout. Um, <laughs> it, seem, it seems I'm the only one that didn't notice I said that. Okay, cool. I need to do that more. Um, right. So we now have a gradient mask that's a linear mask coming in from that top right hand side. That's going to allow us to be a lot more subtle in terms of our fall off. So I can actually pull this even more across to there. And what it means is the viewer isn't necessarily going to see that it's this gradient or a, a, we're trying to illuminate the bear. It's going to see that effectively we've just got this soft fall off of light on the right hand side. And again, so this is vignette right. Let's call another one, vignette, you can probably guess, on the left. And then with this one again, another straight gradient. And I'm going to pull this in here. Don't mind if I go over the bear a little bit, because the longer this stretch is, the softer and less um, obvious the vignette's going to be into there. 
So the result of doing that is that you don't get the viewer seeing this sort of circle or, or halo around your subject. The problem with these radial masks, a lot of people that use them, they've, they've got very, um, I mean, it's become a very popular thing to do. To just effectively what you're doing is you're shifting a central vignette. You're, you're using the central vignette and instead of it being in the middle, you're just putting it over there or there or there or there. The problem with a vignette, a traditional vignette, is it literally looks like you've got a bullet hole in the middle of the shot. And by moving it around doesn't change that effect. By using some gradient masks on layers, some, some straight linear gradial masks on layers, um, you can have a much more subtle effect on the final result without needing to resort or resort to that sort of bang in the middle um, bullet hole effect. So that's what those two layers have done. With that done, with the background, I could, if I want to, pull up a little touch of saturation. I'm happy with the white balance. Let's just have a little tweak because I could warm it just a bit to get a little warmth of that light. We could just tweak that tint just a tiny bit there. It's looking pretty nice. Um, if I wanted to, I could pull down some highlights and some whites just so we don't have any of these hairs over here overexposed too much. Um, I, there's no point in pulling up some shadows or anything like that um, because actually the, the hair needs to be dark. It's, that's what gives it its, um, its uh, shadow and texture and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so with that done, we've now got a bear um, that's isolated through using two gradient masks. Um, we've got a little bit of punch in clarity. We've got a little bit of saturation boost. Um, I'm not going to do anything with levels because we're good with our highlights and our shadows. That looks pretty good. Um, so let's just compare. So if I create a new variant from this bear, there's our original shot. Let's just zoom out. And there's our finished um, edit. So again, small changes. Each, If you look at our sliders, they're all small, small changes. Even the ones with the vignette, you know, it's it's down by one stop. It's, it's not... Um, Sorry, it's down by, yeah, one stop. I was trying to do the maths on the filter um, number. So we're down by one stop. There's nothing major um, in terms of this fall off of light, but it brings the focus back to the bear and it makes that bear the star of the show rather than anything else. What I could afford to do in this finally is bring up a little bit of brightness. I would use brightness rather than exposure um, because I don't want to shift any of the highlights even brighter. Whereas brightness is a little bit kinder, it's going to squish everything rather than shift it off the edge of the histogram. And there we go. Um, but that structure has really brought out this fur um, without increasing any noise in the background because we did it purely on this layer here and purely on that mask. And then we've got a light fall off to the right, a light fall off to the left. And then our background has a bit of saturation boost and a little bit of clarity um, just to make things pop. OK. Um, so we'll stop with the bear with me jokes and all that sort of stuff. And let's go on to this one. So shot by Mark. Um, this is a little while ago, Mark, you sent this in. Sorry, but I've been waiting for the right moment to talk about this one. Um, and today is probably going to be it. So uh, Nikon D800E um, with the lens loaded in, right profile. Good. Um, let's just analyze that CA. So that's done. Um, f5.6, I'm not worried about diffraction on this lens um, particularly. Nice and sharp all the way through. Um, looks really good. Now, we talked about um, styles in one of the pro tips things we did in YouTube. So you can create your own styles. You can create your own um, presets. You can create effectively templates for all of these sliders and you can apply them to your own images. Or you can also go and purchase styles that are from other people, um, other um, artists, but also um, Capture One have a series of styles. One of the ones they uh, released recently was something called Beyond. Um, so Beyond Styles. Um, so you've got Beyond Film, Beyond Black and White, and so on. And this is one where normally I'm not a fan of styles, to be honest. Um, the reason is because I'd much rather you create your own style. If I'm, if I'm honest, it's much better that you guys create a style that re or represents your photography and then you save that as your own style and use that ongoing. But styles can be good for just, you know, having a bit of a think about, let's go into spring just for example, what could the image look like? So, you know, you go from there to this one in spring, makes it look a little bit sort of Mediterranean or Southern France sort of thing. Um, you know, we, we get to some ideas of, oh, yeah, that's how it could look. And that looks pretty good. So to use it as a sort of start of a 10 or a springboard um, and then make some tweaks afterwards, it's not a bad idea at all. 
Um, but there was one thing that I was hoping for, and actually we, we got, frankly, in, um, in the Beyond set, which was something in between these two styles for black and white. So obviously, if I want to do a black and white conversion, so this is the shot out of the camera. Obviously, it's in color. Um, we've got the film standard loaded in as a profile. We can go to auto if we want um, as a curve. Either way, that's fine. Um, but I can go down here and go into black and white, and I can tweak stuff if I want to. So I can say make the blue air or what the areas that would be blue in color brighter, darker. Uh, same with the cyan. Same with magentas. Same with reds. Same with yellows and so on. But it's quite nice sometimes just to have a sort of one click and then you've got something that's, that's really epic in black and white. Now, what you can do is go into these IQ styles. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but there's, see, there's like a load of police cars going by right now. I'm not sure why. Um, so in terms of IQ styles, the IQ actually represents the phase one digital backs. So on a digital back, um, my the medium format digital back, I can choose an IQ style, and one of those includes the black and white option. Um, now, you've got black and white contrast, and you've got black and white neutral. These two tend to, um, let me just go turn that off just so we can um, preview them. So these two tend to be one or the other side of what I want. So contrast tends to be too contrasty. Yes, it does a good job but it also tends to crush some of the shadows. You end up with a real dark shadow um, and actually quite an overdone highlight. So contrast sometimes works, but most of the time it's a bit overdone. Then you've got black and white neutral. Well, that doesn't overexpose the highlights. It certainly doesn't crush the shadows, but it can look really washed out. So what you end up having to do is go from black and white neutral, go into your histogram tab, and then you can obviously change. You can increase some clarity. You can pull up some highlights and, and whites and so on. You're basically adding contrast back into a relatively low contrast style. Well, in the Beyond pack, there's this black and white section under Beyond B&W. And in there, there's this perfect one for me, which is B&W uh, or BW201. So two is a bit heavier, three is heavier still. But 201, in my view, is a perfect mix of between the IQ black and white contrast and the IQ black and white neutral. Um, so instead of these two, this one, it gives you the right amount of contrast, but it hasn't dropped the shadows too much and it hasn't pushed the highlights too far. And this scene in particular is why I've been sort of waiting for, for this one to, to go through Mark's image. This scene in particular, if I go without that style applied there, it's a, it's a nice street scene. But with that style applied, it's just so much cooler. And some things that really, really work in black and white, you've got to have the right black and white. If you just desaturate the image, it looks flat, looks a bit boring. In this case, that style, those, those beyond black and white styles, does a really, really good job of being the sort of midpoint between high contrast, but without losing any detail. And if we go onto our histogram and look at what we've got as a result, that's a pretty nice effect. Um, we haven't got anything that's pushed out too far, haven't got anything pushed too low. Um, it's, a, it's a nice spread of all that data. Okay, so with that done, with that said, if there were any bits we now wanted to tweak even more, and, and let's be honest, the, the star of this shot is, is this line of people here. Um, they really are the star. Now, you could say, well, do they need to be on a third line? Do they not need, well, whatever. I think that works as it is. Um, we're not going to do anything in terms of cropping. So instead, let's just go into here because what we can do with this and what you'll see with that style is it's already tweaked all of these settings. That's exactly what the style has done. So you can see in here, my enable black and white has been automatically ticked because I chose that style and it's pulled down how dark or how bright the reds are. I um, mean, if it were the color image, the yellow elements of the color image have been enhanced. They've been brightened and lightened. The green areas of the image have been darkened, um, cyan images and so on. So if you're ever wondering what a style actually does, just go into the tabs and you can see the effect that it's having. So what it's done is all of this stuff here, all of this stuff here with one click. Perfect. Now, if we want to then, as I say, tweak it anymore, well, of course, we can go on to our, let's say, highlights and you can see black and white, you typically have to increase a little bit of contrast. Well, let's increase that even more. And then you're going to push the highlights further. 
or I could, if I wanted to, if it was too much, I could pull the highlights down. So don't forget on a style, the power of a style is that it's a starting point. You don't have to keep every single setting that Capture One has suggested in that style is the right one for your photo. You can take that style and then do any of these other changes. And of course, then you can save it as your own, which is the other benefit of this stuff. So bear in mind, some of the styles I'm not a massive fan of. I'm not a huge fan of styles overall for my um, photos, simply because I've got my own way of editing and, and I don't want to take someone else's style um, on board. But what you can do is use them as a starting block and then play um, with some of the settings after that as well. So this shot here, there might be a few things we might want to um, play with. We might want to maybe crop out this very bottom part here. I wouldn't want to crop any of this because the distance is important. This CCTV camera is a little bit frustrating that it's there. I don't know. I haven't tried this yet, but let's have a look. I don't think the healing brush is going to be able to do this at all. Um, I think it's just a little bit too tough for it, but let's just have a look. In real terms, what you would probably do is do a stamp or um, or content aware fill um, in a pixel editor instead. Um, but let's see. Yeah. So, you know, at the same time, it's great that Capture One is increasing the tools that are available to us. But the problem is, I think we're getting to a point where people's expectations now is that Capture One is now a pixel editor. It's not. Please don't try and make Capture One a pixel editor. Yeah, that's not a bad start to getting rid of the CCTV camera, but we've got to clone some more stuff from here into there. We've got to blend it properly. We've got to hide it. And then you've got the whole question of whether or not it's right to remove the CCTV in the first place. It's part of the scene, as is this guy up here. Didn't notice him before. So just be, be really, really careful um, with trying to make Capture One do things that actually it was never designed to do. It's a raw editor. It does some great work with raw files. You've got some tools which can get your raw file up to 99% of what you need um, overall. But don't underestimate the usefulness of a pixel-based editor as well later on um, for some of the finer tweaks. Um, JD's just said, oh, hi, Brian. Brian's made it. Cool. Uh, JD's just said, regarding your comment about styles being a starting point, it's a very common refrain in other people's pitch about selling their Lightroom presets. Yeah. Um, I get worried when people buy these presets and, and so on. Um, you see it on, on Instagram, all these adverts where people saying, you know, buy my presets, $15, it will change your photography forever. Yeah, it will. It will change your photography into that person's style. And if that's what you want, then great. But to me, that sounds like a really boring way of doing your photography. Build your own style. Save it as your own preset. Use these things as a starting point. They can, they're great for inspiration. They're great for adding um, some of the some of the extra stuff um, that you, you didn't even think about. You didn't um, even really think through could be possible. Certainly in terms of color grading and stuff like that, they can be a great starting point. But then take it and make it into your own. Um, don't just sit with someone else's way of, of styling a photo. Make it yours instead. Um, so one thing, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, Serge, Serge or Serge, I'm not sure which one's the right, but yes, we could darken the TV camera slightly. Yes, we can. Um, so we'll go into here just very quickly. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna create a very rough mask. So brush tool and oops, turn our mask on. So press M again on the mask. And we're going to pick on our CCTV camera. And then you can probably guess what I'm going to do. Oops, let's just do my erase tool to erase that bit, which was a mistake. So with my mask selected, I'm going to go into Luma range. And let's go display mask is on. And let's see how far we need to push it. So we're only touching the CCTV camera itself. Probably about there. I'm going to go in a little bit tighter and then pull this fall off further. So we've got a softer fall off when we get to the edges of the CCTV camera. Um, I want to make sure we're not including anything in this wall out here. I'm also going to increase the radius around the edge. And let's hit apply. Turn my mask off. Now with this one, I can now pull down the exposure. OK, be careful down here so we can see what's happened. It looks a little bit false down there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase some of the masks. So remember, the Luma range and the mask itself are two different things. So I can erase half of that mask, 50%. The Luma range still applies to it. This exposure still applies to it, but only to 50% 
of whatever area I've now erased half of. Um, okay, so, so just either, either pronunciation is fine. I'm used to it a lot. So am I with reefer and rifer. Rifer sounds really threatening. Reefer sounds like I'm on drugs all the time. Either way, it doesn't matter. I'll answer to both. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, a couple of things on there, Jerry. Yeah, you're right. So this is exactly what I was looking for. I started out using the triax. Um, the the use it as a base is is exactly what I would do. Um, yeah, the preset people have a lot of fanboy following. Of course they do, um, because if you do the one click um, and your photo looks a lot better, then then great. You know, I'm, I'm going to appreciate the person that did that for me. But I'd question whether it was your um, artistic view on it or whether it was actually that other person so you know take yeah I know, you know, nicholas just said you know your photography should be your own so to so take it use it as a basis in the same way that we use software as a basis i couldn't write capture one software um and capture i use capture one to make my photography look the way i want it to um, and that's how i look at styles take a style use it as an inspiration or a start point and take that to you to get your photography how you want it to look um, not just the other person. Okay, so enough about styles. But yeah, to me, this is a this style in particular. I, I'm loving this one at the moment. This BW201. Um, for a lot of the black and white images that I previously have to take one of these two IQ styles and tweak, I can now just rely on this one, um, and it does a really good job out of the box. But again, then tweak it, then make it the the image that you wanted it to be. Okay, um, talking of black and white, so this is a shot from Bill. Just one second, I just need to uh, have a drink for a second. Okay, so for Bill's shot, uh, the question that came in was whether this is too bright and whether or not it would be better in color. So whether it could be better in color, well, let's let's recap what we covered a little while ago, um, which was about the Fuji styles. So this is a raw file and it's coming black and white. Well, how on earth are we gonna do it in color? Well, with the Fuji cameras, remember that they bring into the base characteristics, which is in here under your color tab, um, the ICC profile for sure, but the curve is what you put in um, with the settings on your camera for that shot so in this case if you dialed in one of these choices in your camera the film styles or the film curves that's what comes in across with the raw which is why the raw appears black and white it doesn't mean that the camera has actually thrown away the color data it just means we need to choose a different film curve so in here, we've still got access to the normal capture one. So we've got film extra shadow, high contrast standard, and then you've got the Fuji film individual film styles, and then we've got linear response as well. Um, however, in answer to your exact question, um, I would say actually I prefer it in black and white. Um, and there is, you know, there's this, you've got a red, green, and a yellow filter, for example, that we can choose out of the Fuji monochrome. So the standard shot as it is right there, that's how you chose it out of the camera. If I were to add a green filter onto it, uh, we get a different result. If I had a red filter, different result again. Yellow filter, a different result again. So in my head, the yellow filter actually on a monochrome basis is a good compromise out of all of this. So we're gonna keep it black and white. But what I can do as well in Capture One is normally, I was gonna say can do, <laughs> normally when I use the black and white um, tool in Capture One, it's gonna read the color data to do the black and white conversion. If I change the curve to be a monochrome curve, it can't do that. So if I want more control over this, what I'd have to do is choose a one of the standard um, curves. Oh, let me just, sorry, turn off black and white for a second. So choose one of the standard curves with color in it. So let's go for film standard. Now, if I go to my black and white tool, the areas that were blue up here in the sky, well, I can make them darker. And I think, Bill, you were concerned about this pool in here. Um, so again, with the black and white tools within Capture One, I can take the color image and I can tweak individual channels. So the bits that were yellow, we can make brighter or darker. The bits that were red, we can make brighter or darker and so on. And we can do some split toning if we wanted to. But for me, if I was to just do that, and maybe a bit brighter on the yellow up here, but let's pull down that sky a touch more there i'm going to fix this up here because that's vignetted a bit too much but that gives me a nice 
um, range of contrast in there that I'm pretty happy with. So to fix this up in the top, actually, let's just try something. Let me go to my lens corrections. If I turn up the light fall off, there we go. Fixing it right up. So a light fall off is effectively a reverse vignette. Uh, it's, it's basically making the corners that capture one nose on some of these lenses tend to dim. Um, brings them up brighter, fixes any apparent vignetting. Um, but bear in mind, some of this darkness up here is nothing to do with light fall off or the vignetting. It's to do with the fact that I've told Capture One to darken any cyan area. And in the color image, remember, that area is cyan. So it's going to darken this area more than it would have done over here. So I've effectively countered that by using some light fall off. Now, what that has done is it's, it's unbalanced the image. So on the right hand side now, we've got a little bit of issue um, where we've brightened this up a bit, maybe a bit too much. So on the right hand side, easy fix, brand new gradient layer. Uh, let's draw our gradient mask here and let's draw that nice and softly across and we call this right hand fall off. And with that mask, we're going to pull down our exposure just a little bit. Now I can see a line in here, which I don't like, which means I need to make this even broader just to have a nice smooth fall off of that exposure. The exposure is a bit too much. So let's just pull that back to maybe just under half a stop. That sort of works. It's looking pretty good. Back to my background. Well, I can punch in some clarity, especially on black and white images. Black and white images love clarity. They really make things pop. So let's punch that in there. I'm going to change our crop a little bit. We're going to go to a one by two. And let's go to there. I want this line here of this light lining into this corner. Um, I also want to make sure that we've got a straight and level horizon. So the straightening tool up here. Let's just drag that across here. I have to guess a little bit behind here, but I've got the horizon all the way along here that I can use. So that looks about right there. And then that might change my crop a little bit. So be careful with that. That looks pretty good. And we get to there. Um, let me just uh, go uh, through some of the comments. So uh, Gabriel, uh, if I look at styles, the before often looks better than the after. Yeah, um, quite often. Um, so be careful with the styles. They can you know, remember as well that style is a generic set of changes. They, the person making the style doesn't know what you're presenting. If you present it with a Milky Way, you're going to get a very different effect to if you present it with a portrait or with a, a long exposure of a river or something like that. So choose the right style for your photo, um, most importantly. Um, and yeah, so David, I think in the wrong hands, presets just become something that impresses the, the best uh, and hides image defects. Um, so styles that you've made, and actually you make a very good point. If you're, for instance, a wedding photographer and you've got a, a specific style or a particular feel to your photography, creating your own styles is an amazing way of speeding up your entire processing workflow. Um, and and that's, that's really great. That's a fantastic use of styles. But just using it just to be, or just to be on the current fashion or whatever in, in terms of how it looks without really thinking it through, uh, I'm, I'm not sold on that idea. Um, so yeah, just make sure you're making your photography your own. Um, so Roger just asked, what's the difference between linear response and the base characteristics and the neutral style you showed earlier? Um, linear response is, so there's a, the neutral style. What new, Roger, can you just um, confirm me what you mean by the neutral style in which area in the styles itself? So the black and white neutral or um, somewhere else and I'll come back to you. Um, so, and then Sam, uh, am I going to release any book about Capture One? No, um, probably not. Um, there are some people that have written some really good books. Um, Nils um, has written a really good guide to Capture One. Um, he's, he's done a lot of work with the, the team at Phase One and Capture One. Um, but um, yeah, we'll probably just keep it to these things and some of the video things online. Um, so, uh, so okay, Gabriel, I've used my account for my wife. You're Michael. Cool. Um, so. Michael's online, cool. Um, so back to this shot um, in particular, there is one other thing that I'd be tempted to do with this, which is just to pull in a bit of sky fall off um, up to the top. So I'm gonna call it sky fall off. And we'll put in a, so gradient masks, if they're too flexible and the angles are a little bit difficult to get right, hold down the shift key on your keyboard and it will force it into 45 degree increments. So 90, 45. 
and 100 and then with my mask set like that just remember as well you still want a soft fall off especially on a sky uh, with that we're just going to darken that down just a touch with that done now what i've got is the latitude in this shot to be able to afford to pull my levels uh, let's just go on to our background do it right so i can pull our levels that way that's stretching the bright areas of the histogram brighter and our shadows i can pull the other way as well if i want to but actually i'm going to leave them alone because i don't want to darken these shadows any more than they already are um, and then we go to sort of that and actually as a print on a wall it's a pretty nice shot um, it's got some nice shapes and textures all looks good uh roger in the styles yes so what's the difference between linear response and the neutral style you showed earlier well the the black and white neutral which is this one here um is going to remove all the color data for a start and it's going to apply a, a a curve that the iq digital back will apply to a black and white shot whereas the linear response curve so these film styles here these film curves here um this is affecting effectively well not, not effectively literally the curve um that features on our histogram in here and the linear response curve is effectively more um, true to the actual levels that are recorded in the raw. So let me explain. Uh, let's go to another shot a second. Let's just go to, yeah, let's do this shot for a start. So in here we've got, actually, no, let me just, uh, let me pick a different a different shot. or one with a bit more data in the middle. There we go. Okay, I'm going to go back to Mark's shot. I'm just going to repeat reset all those adjustments right so we have a color histogram here in our curve if i go to my characteristics and go to auto you can see what this curve looks like there okay uh let me just do another clone so we can see them side by side and if i now go to linear response let's just have a look at our curves so look at this curve here this is a linear response curve and look at this curve which is auto and you see this peak that's happened so what on earth think about it what on earth has capture one done between these two shots this one is auto this one is linear response none of these other sliders have been affected it's purely the actual curve and what it's done is capture one will take the data from the raw and it will increase levels of certain um, positions on the histogram and it will decrease levels of certain others it's modifying the curve and it's doing that to add contrast so the auto curve this is why the auto curve tends to look really nice when you first load it in because it's adding contrast the risk with it is that it also pushes highlights to be brighter and it pushes shadows to be darker so if you've got a real challenging image with a lot of dynamic range in it sometimes using the auto curve can push the highlights too far and the shadows too too low as well so if you switch then to linear response this one effectively the curve that capture one loads that raw file in with is a bit more true to the real readout in your camera um, a bit more true in that sense so it's not enhancing the brights or darkening the shadows or anything like that it's literally reading out one for one pretty much um the data that was in the camera and you'll see that the image looks a lot flatter but in partnership with it looking flatter you haven't blown out any highlights you haven't crushed any shadows and you can take that data and now you can manipulate it maybe a little bit more so whereas in this shot we then have to pull down our highlights and down our whites and pull up the shadows a little bit not that much and pull up the blacks to be able to see all the detail starting from a linear response curve i don't need to do that because it hasn't already crushed any of the highlights or shadows or anything like that so we can end up to a similar place, but we get there a different way. So the linear response curve is great when you've got a challenging dynamic range in your shot. Um, that's a very different thing, though, to the style that's loaded in here. These styles do have a curve um, in, in a lot of cases, um, but the linear response curve is there for a very specific reason, which is if you've got a, a huge dynamic range and you're blowing out highlights or crushing shadows, then that linear response curve will take the readout more faithfully from your camera and allow you to tweak it from there. Okay, um, so let's just move on then to Miguel's uh, shot of lightning. Now, um, I've got two shots of lightning on here. Both are well, uh, two people with, with lightning shots. Both are great shots of lightning. Love lightning shots. They're really cool. Um, let's start with this one though. Now, here's the challenge. 
this one um, Miguel you shot at f25 and I get I get why yeah the shutter open for 25 seconds to catch the lightning um, at f25 because um, you're ISO 6400 you could have equally had that shutter open still for 25 seconds but instead of at f25 you could have pushed that down to probably f11 maybe even f8 and then you could have reduced your ISO right the way down you could have pulled that down to you know 1600 maybe even 800 maybe even lower um, the result of that would have been a lot less noise there's so much noise in this image and that's that's one of the challenges you have with this so I can pull in some noise reduction we can we can do our this luminance noise that we're seeing here the problem with noise reduction if I do a before and after is yes this looks smoother on the right but you've also got some artifacts creeping in you've got these weird shapes and patterns these are what we call artifacts um, in processing so whereas on the left the noise is actually covering some of these the second we smooth out the noise and smooth out the image we lose detail for a start that's one byproduct of noise reduction or heavy noise reduction um, but we also tend to then create these weird patterns and when you print it it, it can be a bit of a, a distraction so ideally um, if, if you were able to recreate this lightning scene again um, Mikhail if you could pop out again um, pull your aperture a little bit wider keep your um, shutter speed at 25 seconds it's, it's a great way of capturing lightning you just leave the shutter open and, and at some point the lightning will come in but pull your aperture a bit wider um, get it to f11 if you can and pull that ISO right the way down at f11 you could have got away with an ISO of 1600 and had exactly the same shot but without quite so much noise that would have really helped um, in terms of uh, white balance and stuff personally I'm always a fan of making these a bit cooler maybe down to there um, you know we don't have to worry about sharpening or anything like that I'm not going to pull up any black detail because yeah there we go there's all our noise that's the challenge so with all that noise in there we're, we're quite limited in what we can do with it but in terms of a white balance I'd keep it relatively neutral in this shot and it's really really sort of works um, what you can also do also to help with some of the noise issue um, we could actually pull in a little bit of a gradient up here and pull down that exposure so as, on top of the noise reduction by pulling down that exposure we also have the effect of hiding some of that noise in those dark shadows as well one thing to bear in mind just a bit of a tip for you when you're playing with noise reduction when you zoom out to the fit version capture one relies back to its original preview it's only when you zoom in properly that you actually see the true effect of noise reduction so don't sit at fit um, and then do all of your noise reduction because when you zoom in you gonna have a bit of a shock as to how much you've done what you'll end up doing is doing too much noise reduction if you're zoomed out because you won't see enough of a difference and then as you start to zoom in you'll see it apply the noise reduction you can see there's a little bit of a delay in there in mind so if I go in there you see it takes a little second to switch when you do that you'll see it's done too much and the reason is because you did the noise reduction while zoomed out rather than um, getting in close so to have a look at the difference that using a different ISO would have made um, and I do I, I hope you get the similar shot uh, show again up in the air so here's a shot um, it's six and a half seconds so it's obviously a shorter exposure but at f8 and ISO 200 and you can get away with that um, when there's lightning in the sky um, but with this let's pull up those shadows and the blacks just like I did before and look how much more effective that is without so much noise so this is a shot by Bjorn um, it's a what are we on a Fujifilm yeah it's a um, XF10 um, but look at the difference we've got with that cleaner ISO and just by using a wider aperture shorter period of time for sure but we could have done it for longer if we wanted to but that ISO 200 is is really really important um, so just a couple of things on here um, yeah you also um well, I, or I guess uh once I get the content I have more options yeah the whole point of these sessions is to show you what we can do with little specific tools it's not necessarily to completely edit the photo it's to show you what the options are and then hopefully you can play with it yourselves a little bit later on um so Roger uh shot with the Leica monochrome and got into the habit of studying yeah so uh, absolutely a lot of people choose to start with linear response personally what I find I think I've spoken about this before um, if I start with linear response I end up spending a lot of time getting it back to pretty much what capture one would have done with auto 
if you don't have any problems with the dynamic range and what auto has done you might find that auto is a great starting point but don't rule out linear response when you need it um it's, it's there for that reason um and pablo of course you can say that here um so topaz denoise makes miracles of these images uh, so uh, you can say that for sure there's no there's no limit on what you can say topaz um i've heard people say that they've had great results with it I've tried Topaz. I've been using Topaz for over a decade now. Um, all their different permutations over time. Um, I am permanently disappointed with what it does. And that, that may just be a personal thing. Maybe I'm the only angry, miserable man in the, in the world. But when I put something through Topaz, um, and whether that's Gigapixel or Sharpen or Denoise or whatever, yes, it does what it says it's going to do. So in Denoise, it gets rid of noise. In Sharpen, it does sharpen. But the way it does it, I find to be horrendous. So Sharpen is with these horrible halos, these light and dark halos around every single edge in the image. And it's it's so, um, it's it becomes so obvious when you print it that it's been put through that process. Denoise the same. It, it does some great work in terms of getting rid of noise, but it adds in artifacts. So uh, personally, I, I don't tend to use it. Um, but yeah, as you said, they're waiting for a plugin for Capture One. So they have for Lightroom. I know people that have had good results with it. I haven't, um, and I've, I've tried every version of it that they've ever released. I, you know, I, I buy it out of interest more than anything. I'm hoping one day it will get better. But to me, it's not quite there. The trade-off for getting the, for instance, in Denoise, the trade-off for getting rid of noise isn't worth it when you look at the other effects it has on the image, in my view. Again, personal view, it's not necessarily the, um, the right view. It's just sort of where I come from on that. Okay, so this shot, um, Bjorn shot of lightning, um, same deal sort of thing. We may have a little bit of noise, but actually because it's at 200 ISO, really quite clean, um, really quite sharp, which is great. Um, I am going to cool down just a touch, and this feels a little bit green. I'm not looking, obviously, at the green vineyards and, and, and things here. What I'm looking at is these tones here, which should be relatively neutral. They've got a little bit of a green tint to them, so I'm just going to fix that with a bit of tint there just to get rid of the, the greenness that's happening in there. That's pretty good. I'm going to cool this down a bit more. Let's keep the sky nice and neutral, dark, and, and really quite dramatic. Okay. With this down at the bottom, obviously we pulled up the black quite a lot, so I'm going to leave that down here. I want to see details in the bottom. I do not want to make it the star of the show. So we're going to pull a little bit of shadow, the black down a touch there. And now I'm going to leave the bottom alone. The way that I'm going to do that is create a new mask, a new adjustment layer with a gradient. I could have just clicked on the gradient. In fact, let's just do it. Because I don't have any other layers created, Capture One will automatically create a new layer when I start drawing a new gradient. Um, or go to the topmost gradient layer if it doesn't already, if it's already existing, sorry. Um, and then with that, let's pull up clarity. So in these um, clouds and textures, I want I want a bit more drama. So that's without and that's with. Not too much. So you see this halo it's built around the lightning, that's a bit too strong. So let's pull that back a bit there. Um, pull up a bit of structure. It's going to be great around some of these edges. Um, and then with it, we could probably pull up a bit of contrast if we want to. So remember, contrast, let's go back to the very beginning of this, makes the areas to the right of the histogram brighter, the areas to the left of the histogram darker. In this sky, that's the difference between the sky and the lightning. So in this case, if I pull up contrast, I get a stronger, deeper sky, more dramatic, and a brighter, well, it can't get really brighter than 255, but certainly in some of these little strands out here where they're not quite 255, it's going to make them even brighter still. Um, we could crop down here, but actually we're pretty much um, pretty much on. So let me just load that in and reset. So there's our original. And there's our finished one. If we wanted to play with the white balance independently on the top now, we could. We could just do that and that maybe just to keep it a bit more neutral. We could even, with this top bit, completely desaturate it if we want to get rid of um, quite so much color. I wouldn't go down to there. It looks a bit silly. But you could just pull it down a touch there so it's not quite so colorful. And to me, that sort of works. So we go from there to there. OK. Um, oh, so Lloyd, right there with you with Topaz AI stuff. Yeah. Um, and Brian, yeah, my experience with Topaz um, noise as well. It just seems plastic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, all of these tools, they are great tools if they're used in moderation. Same with Capture One. You can make an image look horrible with Capture One. I've seen it done many times. Um, 
but just use all of these tools in moderation and remember with all of this stuff it's helpful to do stuff on layers because when we've done something and we think actually that's good just turn off the layer have a think about have i gone too far and if i have gone too far i don't have to tweak all of these sliders just take the opacity of the layer down so i can go from no effect to 100 percent effect or anywhere in between so the more you do your edits on layers the more granular control you've got later on if you look at the before and after and go mm, a bit too much then wind it back that's the brilliant part of opacity okay so that's us um today uh next week i think it's next week we will start with rolf's image and we'll talk about that one um but for today we've got a happy bear a style based street scene there uh cool little black and white landscape there miguel's uh, lightning shot that he's going to go out and reshoot um, with a, with another storm make another storm happen miguel will get there um and bjorn shot over the city um cool in the meantime uh, until next week remember you can have a look on that facebook group um so we set that facebook group up to talk about the content in these sessions but also other stuff so obviously in between these sort of things every week um, if there's stuff that comes up or challenges or questions on capture one we can try and answer as many as we can and actually i'm not the one that always answers it quite often someone else has got the right answer so it's a good little uh, good little way of, of working things out um, remember as well you've got the youtube um, tips so things like style creation and preset creation and clarity that's all on youtube so have a look at those they're all free you can download them and watch them whatever um, and then in the meantime ready for the next session which you'll see on our website is announced on the date and time um, then go on to there and you can upload your um, files and we'll have a look at them if we can um, but remember to include your name and please include the raw file, not just the JPEG. We can't do much with that. And in the meantime, then, so that's all the ways to get hold of us. Uh, good to see you all, and we'll catch you next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye.